Sabbath. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, praise God that He's called us to be in His house. And David says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I praise God that, you know, it's such a joy to come and worship our God, but also to see all your beautiful, lovely faces as well. It's good to have fellowship. Uh, it was also David that says, how beautiful it is when brethren dwell together in unity, isn't it? What a lovely thing. And today, as we continue to study the Word of God, we're in Revelation chapter 19. I pray that our hearts may be united as we get ready for the coming of the King. I've entitled this morning, um, this, this subject this morning, the return of the king, but I, I realize that's a uh, Lord of the Rings title. The more appropriate title would probably be the return of the king of kings. Amen? Yes. Amen. So uh, as we get into our study this morning, let us uh, have a word of prayer and invite the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that because of your mercies, you've poured out upon us your Holy Spirit. Because of your love, because of your compassion for us. So right now we plead for more of your spirit to lead us into all truth. We plead, Lord, that indeed you may wash us, that we may be whiter than snow. Cover us with your righteousness, Lord. Help us to accept that gown that you give us, the robe of righteousness. And even as we study and we search your scriptures, we ask, Lord, that you may fill us with your very presence that indeed we may be filled with the power of God in us. Thank you, Lord, for using me today. I pray that you may use me, that I may not be seen, but you may be seen, may be heard and felt by your people today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 19. We covered Revelation chapter 17 when we looked at the judgment of that great whore Babylon. And that judgment was on the adulterous relationship that she had with the, the kings of the earth and that uh, unlawful union of church and state. And the last couple of uh, weeks, Brother Dez had covered Revelation chapter 18, which looked at the relationship that this great whore had with the merchants of the earth and he looked at the financial institutions that went down as a result of their unity with Babylon. And then this morning we're going to look at the final part of the judgment, the destruction, complete utter destruction of anything that unites with Babylon. And this is why the second angel message calls us to come out. And Revelation 18 also echoes that call to come out of her that we may not be receivers of the plagues. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. And this section is titled, The Sup Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Hallelujah. These people in heaven are shouting, is singing something. This word, Alleluia, is, this is the first time it is mentioned, and the only time it's mentioned in the New Testament. And when you break the word down, it means praises to Yahweh, or praises to Jah. They're singing praises to Jah because of the salvation that he has wrought on their behalf, which identifies these people as ones that have been saved by God. Amen? They're saying hallelujah because the glory of that salvation does not belong to them or anyone else. That glory belongs to God, and so does the honor and the power unto the Lord our God, unto the Lamb. 
And we see a similar um, thing in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Revelation 11, 15. I love when those pages are turning. Revelation 11, 15, you hear, The seven angels so sounded, and there was a great voice in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his, of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So at this point, we see that God is now king of this world, king of kings of this world. Before when Jesus came as a babe, when he was in a manger, when he grew up on this earth as a man, we see that he was the lamb. But when he comes back, he is the lion. He was crowned king because Zechariah tells us that, behold, your king comes riding on a colt. So Jesus was king. But now he is king of kings. And we'll explore that a little bit later. Because he is taking over the kingdoms of this world. And he is going to reign. He's going to reign over the other kings that he has made. And the Bible tells us that he has called us to be priests and kings. He has called us, those who believe in him, to be priests and kings. And so he now becomes the king of kings. We continue, they say, hallelujah, hallelujah. And this is the same form of the word hallelujah that we find in the Hebrews, which means praises and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. In Revelation, um, Revelation chapter 19, 2 says, For true and righteous are his judgments, True and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and had avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. God has avenged the blood of his servants. And remember in Revelation chapter 6 verse 10, let's go back there, we, we've looked at this before. Revelation chapter 6 verse 10, these are the servants of God here and says, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? These were the souls under the altar. And they were given white robes. And just bear that, keep that in mind. They were given white robes. They were told to what? To rest a season until their fellow servants the brethren were killed in the same way as they were killed. These souls under the altar were told to wait. Their question was how long, and God says to wait for a season, and then this season has now taken place. Now the fellow brethren were killed in the same way as they were killed, and God has now judged and avenged his servants. We are told that we should leave vengeance to God. You remember that? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will, I will repay. We shouldn't take vengeance in our hands. We should allow God, who is just and true, to repay the vengeance. And so God has judged the great whore, and he has avenged the blood of his servant. He has given her double for what she had given God's servants. Double. And so the prophecy now has been fulfilled where the servants were waiting, the time of waiting is now ended. And again, in verse 3 of Revelation 19, you might want to leave a bookmark in there. Verse 3 of Revelation 19, And again they said, Alleluia! Praise to Jah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Now, Des dealt with this last week when he spoke about the, the smoke 
that rose up. And it is the consequence of what God has done. It's not that she's going to be burning forever, but the smoke rises up forever because of the consequence of what God has done. And we can see in Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 10, if you go with me there, Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 10, When you're there, say amen. Isaiah 34 and verse 10. Amen. And it says, It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke there shall go up forever. From generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. This He's talking about the destruction of the judgment of God on the nations and the destruction that will follow. This destruction from our perspective will happen at the end of the world. And the cities that will lie ruin and waste will pass on for generations to generations. Now how long is a generation? Does anyone know according to the Bible? Forty years. Now remember, the saints of God will be in heaven for how long? A thousand years. So if you divide, those were quick at maths, divide a thousand by 40, how much do you get? How many generations is that? A lot, yes. (laughs) That's a lot of generations. So the cities will lie in waste and ruin generations and generations. And the reminder will be there before God for many generations. Because why? Because God, he does not forget. He understands and he he understands the, the, the pain that people feel and the pain that people go through. And as Des always says, he calls it his strange act. He doesn't like to destroy. And we'll go through that a little bit later. Verse 4 of Revelation 19, back to Revelation 19. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Alleluia. The four beasts, we've we've discussed this four beasts before, Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. They're now before the throne. They're worshipping God. They're saying, Amen. What does that mean when it says, Amen? Sorry? So shall it be, so let it be. God has judged the great whore. He has destroyed her and given her double for what she has done to the servant, to his servants. And the beasts, they agree and they worship God saying, this decision that you have made, this judgment that you have passed on this great whore is right and just. So let it be, glory, praise to Jah, praise he, the Almighty. Verse 5. Actually, before we get to verse 5, it's it's important to note here that this is like a, a chorus of praise coming up before God. Praise for what he has done to this great whore. But, I don't think we we recognize just how important it is to praise God. You see, these four four creatures, they're constantly before God, and they're constantly praising God. Everything that he does, they're praising him. And you know, it's interesting to know that even Christians, sometimes when something happens in our lives that doesn't go according to our plans, What do we do? We question God. We don't praise Him. Why, Lord? Why has this happened to me? Why these situations turn out this way? Why is the world going this way? Why, why, why? But these creatures, the the, the living creatures that stand before God and the 24 elders, They always praise God because they know every decision that God makes is just and true and right. When are we going to get to that position? 
When will we get to the place when we say, praise the Lord? You know, the Bible tells us that in all things we should what? We should give thanks. This is the will of God to us. When we really, truly understand the character of God, we will praise Him for everything that happens in our lives. Psalms 134. You know, the, the psalmist David was, was a man that, that praised God quite a lot. Maybe he understood something that we don't understand. Psalms 134, verse 1. David says, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. So those people who stand in the house of the Lord, those people who are called his servants, should cultivate an attitude of praise. Amen? Look again at Psalms 135, just the next chapter. He says, Praise he the Lord, praise he the name of the Lord, praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. He calls us to praise. And the Bible tells me that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. We want to experience the presence of God, we need to learn to praise God more. Amen? And I tell you, the Seventh-day Adventists, we, we really could take a, a lesson of praise from some, some of the evangelicals. That's probably the only thing that we could take. We need to learn how to worship God more. We need to learn how to praise Him more, to give Him glory, not just in how we live, but by the fruit of our lips as well. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Back to Revelation chapter 19, in verse 5. Revelation chapter 19, verse 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye servants that fear him, both small and great. Now he tells us that who should praise him? Not just the servants, but those who are small and great should praise him. But notice the reason why. It's not just because what he's done, but because what he's about to do. In verse 16 he says, And I heard a voice, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and a voice of many waters, and a voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Praise the Lord for his mighty works. Praise the Lord for his mighty acts. But praise the Lord for who he is. He is the Lord God omnipotent. What does that mean, omnipotent? All-powerful. When we think of someone that's all-powerful, we think of someone who's got lots of money. But the word here used in the Greek suggests that all power from every realm and aspect of life has been given to him. Every single aspect of our world, the universe, the um, whatever it is, has been given to him. He is all-powerful, and he reigneth. You know, when we look at this, this aspect of God's character, people can sometimes fear someone who is powerful. Because you know that saying where they say, power corrupts, right? And absolute power corrupts absolutely. But why is it that God has all power, but at the same time, he's so merciful, so kind, and so loving? We're going to look at that a little bit later. But the voices here come back, and they, they resound a praise that reflects the character of God. The voices in heaven shout a praise, and then these other voices come back. He says, I heard, as it were, a voice of great multitude, a voice of many waters, a voice of mighty thundering, saying, So who are these people? Who are these in verse 6 here 
were resounding the praise of God. Well, I believe you can find them in Revelation chapter 14, verse 2. Revelation 14, verse 2. For context, Revelation 14, verse 1, it says, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000, having their father's name written in their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven as a voice of many waters and a voice of great thunder, a voice of harpers harping. These are the redeemed of the earth. They are singing or shouting Praise to God Almighty. The 144,000, they are saying, Alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent reign. They recognize that God has now taken his kingdom and he is reigning with them. Psalms 97, Psalms 97, verse 1. We're running through the Bible here, we're going backwards and forwards through the Bible. It says, men shall run to and fro. We're running to and fro this morning. And the knowledge will increase. And we're told that by an increase of knowledge, a people are to be prepared to stand in the latter day. We're preparing to stand in the latter day here today, saints. We've got to go backwards and forward through the Bible. Psalms 97, verse 1. The Bible says, The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitudes of the isles be glad. The Lord reigneth. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitations of his throne. What are the habitations of his throne? Righteousness and judgment. I want you to keep that in mind. The Lord reigns and these two things are the habitations of his throne. Usually when a king reigns, from his throne, he has policies that he reigns by. And we've seen a lot of people reign and rule, and a lot of them rule by tyranny, sheer force. Even recently, we see what happened in America with the, the White House, that they, they, this is the seat of their power, and they, they reign by a process known as democracy. But God reigns through righteousness and judgment. And we'll explore that a little bit later. So, verse 7. Back to Revelation 19, verse 7. Command comes to us now. He says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. The marriage of the Lamb is come. Another reason to rejoice, God tells us. So let me ask you a question now, and I want you to uh, think about this for a few seconds before you answer. Who is the wife here that has made herself ready? The, yeah, I, I, I thought you would say that. <laughs> the church. I did say think about it for a second. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We see who the bride is. Revelation 21. We're looking at verse 2. John tells us, says, I saw the great, I, saw, I John, sorry, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, what? Prepared as a, as a bride adorned for her husband. Who did John see? The new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. And we're told, you know, inspiration tells us, when we look at this parable of the, the, the in Matthew chapter 25, we have a parable of the five wise and five foolish virgins, right? And they're, they're going into the, the married supper. I'm not, I'm not going to go there because we know the story of the, the virgins very well. They're going to, they've been invited into the, 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 the marriage supper. 
and the bridegroom delays his coming, and the foolish virgins, they run out of oil in their lamps, right? Amen? And then the wise virgins, they end up going into this supper. Who does the virgin represent? The church, right? He says, in the parable, I'm reading now, it says, in the parable, when the bridegroom come, came, they that were ready went in with him into the marriage. The coming of the bridegroom takes place before the marriage. It's important. We're going we're gonna to unpack this just a little bit. It says, the coming of the bridegroom takes place before the marriage. And this is how it used to be in the in a Jewish system. Is that a man would be betrothed to a wife. Now this is a, a, an English word which means engaged, right? The betrothal process used to take place before the marriage. They would go and they would be betrothed to a wife and um, later on he would come and he would have the, the marriage. But the betrothal is considered to be the marriage. Unlike the engagement in our Western culture, once you've been betrothed to someone, you, that's it. You're considered to be married. You can't break off the betrothal. And so we see the same when Joseph was, Mary was betrothed to, to Joseph. The marriage supper didn't take place yet, but he, they were considered as good as married. And this is, we have this, I mean, um, in my wife's culture, they have something that's known as lobola, which means uh, it is the bride's price. So the, the husband would go and he would consult with the, the, the family and they would say, you know, I would like to take your daughter, you know, because the family is considered to be losing a daughter here and the uncles and the grandmas and everything, and they agree upon what you would do for her and for you to be able to take her to become yours. And so once you, you, you pay that, you agree on this lobola, she is considered to be your bride. This is how it was. So this is considered to be when the, the bridegroom comes, okay? This is not the marriage supper. The coming of the bridegroom takes place before the marriage, the man would sometimes come and he would, he would betroth the wife. Then he would go back to his father's house. And then, when the time comes, he would come and he would take the wife and they would make their own home. And so the Bible tells us, there shall a, then shall a, a man, how, how does it go? A man shall leave his mother and a woman leave her home and the two shall be joined together, they shall be one. And so we see this plays out with the church and the Christ as well. So when Christ came, he, he what? He did betrothed the, the church, the woman. And he went away back to his, his father's house, right? And he says, I'm going to do what? I go to my father's place, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there he may be also. All right. Just a picture. The marriage represents the re re uh, reception by Christ of his kingdom. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, the capital, and the representative of his kingdom is called the bride, the lamb's wife. We just read that in Revelation chapter 21. He says, said the angel to John, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit says the prophet, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Revelation chapter 21, 9 and 10. The bride represents the holy city, and the virgins that go out to meet the bridegroom are symbols of the church. So the bride is the, the city, and the, the virgins are symbols of the church here. It says, in the Revelation, the people of God are said to be guests at the marriage supper. If guests, they cannot be bride, Christ will receive, so Christ will receive from the Ancient of Days in heaven, dominion and glory and a kingdom the new Jerusalem, the capital of his kingdom, 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Having received the kingdom, he will come as king of kings and lord of lords for the redemption of his people who are to be partakers in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we looked at Daniel 7, 14, where he, he goes to receive a kingdom from the Ancient of Days, and in Revelation 21, verse 2, and this is from HF uh, 2.64. So Christ receives a kingdom and he becomes the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he goes into this marriage supper and he invites his guests to come into this marriage supper uh, with him. Looking at verse 7, it says, uh, again, um, Revelation 19, verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice, so the time has come for the marriage. Um, the bride has made herself ready. In other words, the kingdom is ready. Everything is... Jesus said he went to prepare a place. That place has now been prepared for us. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in white linen. So fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And I want you to imagine this for a second, right? When the saints fill up that kingdom in New Jerusalem, it will look like a bride on her wedding day. It will look like completely covered in white. But what is the white? What is the white nest, the white linen that covers the New Jerusalem? What is it? The righteousness of the saints. So all the saints that will go will be in the city will be righteous. Do you get that? We don't need to miss that because this is very important. The people that are in the city are righteous people. And, and if you were here, uh, last couple of uh, afternoon programs where Pastor Keith dealt with you know, overcoming sin and the righteousness of Christ by faith, no one can argue that this is a goal that God has set for his people. His people, the final people in his kingdom, needs to be righteous. Amen? But that righteousness does not come by our own works. The righteousness comes by the gift of God. And we looked at that. There's another parable in um, Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 to 14. Um, for, for time's sakes, I won't go through it. But in that parable, the, the, the guests were called to the supper as well. Do you remember this one? And then in this, many of them were called, they had excuses. They, they couldn't make it because of their various reasons. And then eventually they went out to the highways and the byways and they called the, the, the strange folks like you and me, right? And they came into the, the supper. But then there was this one guy, one guy that didn't have the wedding garment. And he was kicked out. So everyone that makes it into the city in the end will have to have that wedding garment. And we know in the, in, the, in the ancient Jewish times, the wedding garment as well as the invitation both came from the king. The one who was inviting them provided the, the wedding garment as well as the invitation. Does Christ provide us with the wedding garment? His righteousness. He holds out the gift of his righteousness. And uh, there's a little book we've been going through in the devotional, in the, um, the prayer meetings, the Perth prayer meetings, and it's it's, it's victory in Christ, V-I-C-H. It's very difficult to find, but it's, it's, it, unless you type this V-I-C-H, it says, the gift of his righteousness is not an entry or a credit on the side of the ledger account in the books of heaven to balance a troublesome account, a transaction entirely devoid of any personal touch with me. It has to do with my inmost being. This is the, the, the gift of righteousness. He says, it purifies the current of my life and sweetens my thinking, my speaking, and my doing. It makes me a new creature in Christ Jesus. This is the gift of righteousness. It's a total transformation. It's not a cover for our sins. It's a trans transforming experience that God gives us. And so the bride has made herself ready because God has given the righteousness by faith. 
and they've received that. And this is what the three angels' message is. When the three angels' message is preached like it should do, this is the experience that those who hear it and receive it will have. And so we know that this is talking about a time when the three angels' message has been preached, when the three angels' message has been received, and when souls are transformed and are ready for the coming of Christ. In verse 8, she was granted that she may um, find in him, which is the righteousness of the saints. Um, Psalms 132, verse 9. I'm going to try and go through these a little bit quicker. Psalms 132, verse 9. You can write these down uh, if you've got a pen and a paper and, and go through them in your own time. It says, Let thy priest be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. When we are clothed with righteousness, then we have the joy of the Lord in us. The joy of the Lord as our strength. Let's move on quickly in verse, back to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, it says, And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are true sayings. The marriage supper of the Lamb is going to take place. But there are people that have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And these people are blessed. Because this will take place when God receives his kingdom and we are enjoined together with him. In verse 10. Verse 10, and he says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See that thou do it not, for I am thy servant, and of thy brethren, which have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And this is where we, we get the, the explanation for the, the Revelation chapter 12, 17. Revelation 12, 17. Let's go there quickly. I know we know this, but um, Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12, 17. We're told... The dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of, of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So this is where we get the explanation. What the testimony of Jesus is, is that it's the spirit of prophecy. So these are two of the identifying marks of the remnant church. Identifying marks of the remnant church is that they keep the commandment of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. And we see that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And this spirit of prophecy was present in John the Revelator. As a matter of fact, this is the main reason why he was on the Isle of Patmos. In John chapter 1, uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 verse 2, we see that it says... Revelation chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus. So John, he bore record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In, in verse 9, that same chapter, chapter 1, verse 9, John says, I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and in patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. This is the reason why John ended up on the Isle of Patmos. It's because of the word of God and for what? The spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy could get you into trouble. You know, apart from the fact that they couldn't kill him, <laughs> this is the reason why they exiled him on the Isle of Patmos. Because of the word of God and because of the spirit of prophecy. It's because of the things that he believed. Jesus Christ was revealed to him. Because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. When you testify of Jesus Christ, you could get into trouble. And you, you say, well, there's so many churches out there, you know, they're testifying of Jesus Christ, but are they really telling the full story? 
are they telling a half a story about Jesus? The truth is, Jesus came, but he's coming again. And Jesus has a mandate for his church to live up to that righteousness, to receive that righteousness, and to live an example for him. You know, this gift of prophecy, we're told, is, was in the life of Ellen White. Ellen White exhibited this gift of prophecy in her life. And this is an excerpt um, A.G. Daniels was, wrote. When he says, um, taking the Bible as a supreme guide of her life, this is Ellen White, she became fully convinced by his teaching that the second of coming of Christ was near at hand. On this point, she never wavered. So she always believed that Jesus Christ was coming soon. And so she lived her life in preparation for the imminent return of Christ. She never wavered. And again, he says, um, and believe in it with her whole soul, she felt that the one supreme purpose of every individual at this time should be to live blameless life, to live a blameless life in Christ. This is what she believed. And many, many Christian churches don't teach that. And to devote every resource at command to the salvation of the lost. This view led her to unceasing prayer for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And I think, you know, this is what they've been praying for in the, in the prayer meetings here with Ray and the, um, everyone else. Been praying for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Her yearning for the divine presence was answered beyond all that she could have conceived. Her life of full surrender obedience and prayer for divine help was rewarded by the bestowal of the gift of prophecy, one of the choicest gifts of the Spirit. So the Spirit gives us the gift of prophecy, amongst other gifts as well. But he says this is one of the choicest gifts of the prophecy. And this is because of her life of surrender, full surrender and obedience. Following this surrender and victory, there came to her a series of remarkable spiritual experiences, unmistakably genuine and regarded by her associates, workers of that day, as a manifestation of the gift of prophecy promised by Christ to the Revenant Church. Those who had been associated with her um, through all this time have never had occasion to alter their conviction that the revelations which have come to her through the years came directly from God. And such a blessing, huh? Such a blessing for us to have this writings of Ellen White. And you know, um, Brother Alf just gave me this book this morning. It's called The Impending Conflict. And you know, when you read a book like this from Ellen White, and I challenge people out there that are, that are not strong believers, I believe in this gift of prophecy. And you read the desire of ages, how it uplifts Christ. It's one of the, the few books that have been translated in more languages, um, more languages like the Bible. One of the few books. And she is listed as the top selling female bookseller. Top selling bookseller. Um, J.K. Rowling is coming up there, you know? But has published more books than any other female publisher in the history of this world. But the evidence is, is in when you read her writings and see how Jesus Christ is uplifted. No question, no doubt, that this spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus in verity. Amen? And we are so, so happy that we have these little directions and guidance from God through Ellen White. And now the, the theme changes to become something a little bit more, more serious. Let's go further in Revelation chapter 19. This section is known as the, the beast and the false prophets. Verse 11, it says, And I behold, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True, 
and in righteousness he does judge and make war. Faithful and true. Who does that remind you of? Jesus, right? Reminds us of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, we're told that he is a faithful and true witness. And Revelation 6 verse 2, looking at the, the, the horse, the, the rider on the white horse, we can see that this was this is no other than Jesus. Went forth conquering as to conquer. Revelation 3.14 as well, we can see that this is a direct image of Jesus. In verse 12 we say, His eyes were like flame of fire. And we've dealt with this before so many times. Reve Revelation chapter 1.14, Daniel chapter 8, we see that this is a picture of Jesus. So Jesus is here seen riding on a white horse. But notice, it says, And true and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. Now this doesn't make sense. How can you make war in right doing? Well, you make war against people who are doing wrong things, right? It makes sense. If someone is doing something wrong and you come and you do something right, you're actually making war with that person. And you know that some people will find it very difficult to sit with the police, you know? And they get uncomfortable when they're driving and the police comes next to them. Because they feel like they're doing something wrong. But here, Jesus is the doer of righteousness. His righteousness raises war with unrighteousness. His righteousness raises war with unrighteousness. And we talked about that, that his, the, the, his throne, his throne was judgment and righteousness. He, he can't do anything apart from righteousness. He's stuck on righteousness mode. Let's go to verse, um, verse 12. His eyes were a flame of fire, and upon his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And we talked about the eyes of the flame of fire, the crowns here mentioned in, in the Greek word is not Stephanos, the victor's crown. It's actually diadema, which is a crown of crowns. In other words, it's, it's like one crown that looks like many crowns. And it says here in the, in, the, in the English version, many crowns upon his head. And we remember that song where they sing, crown him with many crowns. The Lord upon his throne. And uh, I love that song, and I probably should have put that in the, <laughs> in the final hymn. Um, and we see here that he upon his head many crowns, so he had the king of kings, but he also had a name that was written that knew, no one but himself knew. And also in Revelation 2, 17, we see that this is a very similar story to... Those who are overcomers, Revelation 2.17, that they were also given a name that no one but themselves knew. It explained that they had a journey, an experience with God that no one else had. They had overcome things with God that no one else knew about. And as a result, they got a name that only themselves knows, that they overcome things that they didn't know. In verse 13 it says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. John chapter 1 verse 1. Who is the Word of God? It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We see that this same Word is none other than Jesus Christ. And Jesus is here seen riding on the white horse, and his vesture dipped in blood. Interesting symbology, isn't it? Vesture dipped in blood. You know, we're going to pick that up a little bit, in a little bit, right? Where's verse 14? It says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. The armies in heaven now are coming with him. 
What is, who, is, who is the armies in heaven? The angels. The angels. We see um, in Matthew chapter 16. Let's, let's, let's go there quickly. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, we're going to read verse 27. Matthew 16, 27. Matthew 16, 27, the Bible says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall give and then he shall reward every man according to his... So the angels are coming. But why are the angels coming? Matthew chapter, thir go with Matthew chapter 13, 39. Matthew 13, 39. Give every man according to their, their reward. Matthew 13, verse 39. Just a few chapters over. Verse 39, it says... The enemy that sowed them was the devil the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels the angels are actually coming to do some some reaping jump down to verse 49 verse 49 it says it explains it says then it shall be at the end of the world that the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just this is the word of god this is the word of jesus christ it's written here the angels are going to be the one that sever the wicked from among the just. I remember that one time that one angel came and he killed how many? How much was it? 180 something thousand? One angel. One angel. So imagine all of the angels in heaven coming. Imagine that. Now that's, that's a terrifying sight if you're, if you're a wicked person. I'd be afraid, you know? But we're told that the, 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 the reward is going to be both for the wicked and for the just. What's going to be the reward of the just? He's going to take them to heaven. He's going to take them to heaven. God is going to take them to heaven. And we are told that eyes have not seen, nor ears have heard, nor entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for his people. God has something amazing and wonderful for his people. But look at the language as well. He says that they're coming to reap the harvest of the earth. I went to Revelation chapter 16. It talks about the, the grapes, you know. The harvest of the earth is ripe. Thrust in your sickle, it says, and collect these ripe clusters. And I believe this is where the blood came from, you know. When you, when you reap grape sometimes, and it's not white seedless grape, you can get a bit of stain on your clothes, and it looks a little bit like, like blood. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, um, in Isaiah ch chapter 63, I'm going to read this for you. You don't have to turn there. Isaiah 63 says, Who is it that cometh from Edom and dyed garments from Bozrah? So the garments look like they're dyed. You know, because... Jesus here, he's, he, he's trod in the wine press. And you, you know, if, if you trod wine press in white clothes, what's going to happen? It's going to get red, isn't it? He says, this is that glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak is righteous, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the winefat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people that were none with me. For I tread them in mine anger, and I trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garment and I will stain all my raiment for the day of the vengeance of the Lord is in mine heart and the year of my redeem is come. It's two simultaneous things happening here. God is destroying those who destroy 
not only the planet, but also his people. Straddling the winepress alone. In verse 15, Revelation chapter 19, 15, we're told, Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword to smite all the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of God alone. And we, we, we've talked about that sword of iron, Revelation chapter 12. Um, but we know that this sword is the word of God, and the word of God is the righteousness of God, Isaiah 11, 4 to 5. Also Psalms 19, verse 9. I'm skipping through that a little bit. But, but notice here that this sword comes out of his mouth. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, when you look at the Antichrist, the Antichrist, let's, let's go there. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, looking at verse 8. It's a little bit of context. So, so, so it says, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Who is this? This is the, the Antichrist, right? Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Uh, and when you really study this passage, you can see that there's going to be, there's two different words here used for the word coming, right? The first one is the parousia, which is a bright, visible coming. So, so the, the, the Antichrist is going to have a coming which is very similar to Christ, except his feet will touch the ground. But when Christ comes, his feet will not touch the ground. He won't go around. He will just call his people to him. And so we see that the, the destruction that comes out of the, 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 the mouth of the Lord is his word, but also the brightness of his coming will destroy the wicked. Um, verse 16. We've got seven more verses to go. And he, Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. And he hath on his vesture, um, on his vesture, and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you know the vesture is his clothes, but also the thigh represents the place where covenants are made. Back in the Old Testament days, it's where a place where covenants were made. Revelation seventeen fourteen, and Isaiah twenty seven four. You can write these down as well, and. Um, And then I saw, verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying unto all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. So this is a second invitation for a supper. The first invitation goes to the supper of the, of the, the lamb and his wife. The second invitation goes out to the, the birds. And when you look at the birds here, like the fowls, the, the, the Greek word used for the fowls, he's talking about like vultures, you know? The fowls that feed on carcasses of dead things. And uh, it makes you wonder, what sort of invitation is this, you know? God is about to, to do a strange act here, a strange word. In Matthew chapter 20, and Matthew chapter 28, let's, let's go there. Matthew 28, sorry, 24 verse 28. When, um, when you hear people talk about the, the secret rapture, have you heard of the secret rapture? This, this destroys the secret rapture. There's no, there's no secret about the coming of God. You know? And they, the question is asked, Matthew chapter 24, verse 28. The question is asked, where? Where? And the answer is, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. And just a little bit of context here. We might have to go back a little bit. Um... When the, the, the devil comes to impersonate Christ, 
there be many who will think that this is the, the new Jerusalem set up on earth. Because the, Je the Jesuits have, have, have done such an amazing job tricking the public, the, 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 the Protestant world, into believing that they're going to have seven years more to repent. It's the worst lie. It's the worst lie. Because you think, oh, oh I've got seven more years. You need to keep on doing what you're doing, you know? There's no need for a change. And they're, they're told that, you know, they're going to be people who are going to be disappearing. One will be in the mill, two will be in the mill grinding together, and one will disappear. And so, the, the, in Luke chapter 30, Luke, Luke chapter 17, verse 30, he gives us a picture that, look, the one that's going to be taken is the one that's going to be, his life's going to be taken. That life is going to be the one that's going to be taken. And then the birds will gather. He says, one will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. And the, the, the disciples ask him, where will they be taken? And he says, where the, the carcass is, there will the vultures gather. And the carcass is going to be here, left here on earth. That's where the vultures are going to be gathered. It's very important that we recognize the false theories and that we can address these. I mean, given the time up signal there, I'm just going to finish these last few verses. You can write these texts down from Revelation chapter um, 18, um, 19, verse 18. The, these fowls have been called to the, the supper, verse 18, that they may eat the flesh of kings and captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, they that sit upon them, the flesh of all men, both free and born, small and great. And uh, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat upon the horse and against these armies. So there, there's, there's a battle going on here now. This is the final battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16, 13 to 14 tells us that the, the three unclean spirits like frogs went out to gather the whole earth for this battle, the battle of Armageddon. And Daniel 11, 40 to 45 tells us this is the final stage where the, the armies of Satan are aligned against the armies of God. And then verse 20 says, The beast was taken, and with him the false prophets that wrought miracles before him, and deceived them that um, received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. Both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and i just need to um need to highlight there that the the work of the false prophet is to deceive people into receiving the mark of the beast they're not going to come and say here's the mark of the beast are you going to take it it's going to be a deception yeah um they were cast into the lake of fire and we know that the lake of fire was prepared for the the devil and his angels matthew 25 verse 41 and uh, Revelation 20 verse 10 tells us that this is where the devil is also going to go. So the beast, the false prophet, all of them are going to go into the lake of fire. The devil is also going to go there. But who else is going to go into the lake of fire? Last text. Revelation 21 verse 8. Revelation 21 verse 8. I'm just going to read this for you. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable murderers, whoremongers, Sorcerers, idolaters, liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, the king of kings is coming. We've got to be prepared. You know, um, a final quote here. Ellen White says, We are to be preparing for what's about to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. It's going to, shouldn't surprise us. So this afternoon, we're going to be looking at the events. We're going to be looking at the events. We're going to be plotting an events calendar. Because, you know, um, we're counseled, the spirit of prophecy counsels us that, you know, um, the events are clearly revealed. But multitudes still have no understanding of these things. So we're going to go through these events. We're going to look at each event and how they're going to be fulfilled in their order. Um, so, so that we're not surprised. 
uh, and that we can help others as well who have been caught in this delusion. He says, transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world, and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. God's people should be preparing for what's about to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Our time is precious. We have but a few, a very few days of probation in which to make ready for the future immortal life. And I pray that we, we take this time and this opportunity that we may get ready for what's about to happen. Um, we'll just close with our final hymn, 432. Maybe we can change the hymn to um, Crown with Many Crowns. Does anyone know? It? Is, that, is that okay? Music director. Crown with Many Crowns. Two, two, three. Father, we crown you King of Kings, Lord of Lords today. In our hearts, Lord, we empty ourselves. We pray that you may take full control of the throne of our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you may live out your life within us. We ask that as your servants, we may be humble, peaceful, and gentle just like you. We ask, Heavenly Father, may you lead us 
in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Bless us now as we fellowship together. As we go, may we go with you in grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.